space. Hello there, space people. Welcome to the podcast. You know, it's funny. There are a few times I get really anxious about recording on a certain day, you know, getting ready for the week and make sure we get that stuff done. And the thing I've learned recently is that when I just wait and not rush, new things seem to pop up. And so I'm adjusting to when the right day is to release this podcast. If you guys have a specific day you're looking for, let me know. But right now, it looks like a lot of the space news is popping up on Mondays. So we'll probably try to have a podcast here on Tuesday so that I can catch up on any new stuff that's come out. So let's talk about what we need for this week. Today in space, I want to cover some of those new breaking space industry topics in orbital news, as well as my thoughts on Rocket Lab. And because I've really started following their company, I really... I've been following them for, for a few years, but now I'm really getting excited about what they're offering the small satellite launch market, and we'll talk about their eighth successful launch of the Electron rocket. I'll finish out this week with my hypothesis on why I think people, including myself, love SpaceX so much. I believe there's a, there's a reason behind why so many of us love SpaceX, and so I'll throw a hypothesis at, that, at the end of this week's episode. Let me know what you think. Let's begin with some orbital news. To start this week's orbital news segment, we eagerly await the next SpaceX 200 meter Starhopper test. SpaceX is ready to go and just waiting for the FAA to approve the test launch. According to Elon Musk on Twitter, it looks like it was a good conversation with the head of the FAA of space. They need a bit more hazard analysis and should be clear to fly soon. It's important to note that on the last 20 meter launch of the Starhopper, which was basically a water tank with rockets on it, it did catch fire to a nearby brush that was handled and it was taken care of. But my guess is the FAA is taking a closer look into the hazards and preventative measures SpaceX will need for the next one. Starship has a lot more power and engines than Falcon 9 ever did in initial testing, which is what I used to watch back in college when I was a freshman, sophomore, those early years, 2010. That, that was very exciting development of the Falcon 9, the Grasshopper, test legs that were literally just a rigid structure on the bottom and they were just trying to launch the rocket and land it. We're seeing the same type of thing here with Starhopper. So we're excited to see what happens, especially since uh, it, it's not surprising that the safety measures are increasing with the size and power of the spacecraft. So we'll have more to update soon. There we should have an update soon on Starship as a whole, as a product as a whole. We'll follow up on that. Next up, India's Chandrayaan-2 mission, which has just entered lunar orbit after spending a month on its way to the moon. To give some context and comparison to that length of a mission, with their mission taking a month, the Apollo 11 mission took roughly four days from Earth to the moon. And it's just a great example that there's not just one answer to solve a problem. There's nothing wrong with the fact that India takes a month and it took four days. That's not, it's just a different mission structure. It's, you've got to figure out if, if that's the length of time it's going to take for you to send humans, you've got to prep for the fact that it takes a month to send people to the surface and then back. You know, a big part of the reason I would guess it took four days is because that's how long they could actually keep these people alive. So, plus they had an extremely powerful rocket, the most powerful the world has ever known, Saturn V. But like I said, it's really just amazing to see that there's not just one answer to solve a problem. In this case, going to the moon's surface. As an aerospace engineer, I can't help but think about how many different missions and orbits and techniques could be found when more people with more backgrounds and beliefs start to travel and think about traveling through space. The innovation that'll happen when more countries reach for the stars and become spacefaring nations will be incredible for space science and development, and most likely for everyone around the world. We'll continue to monitor this orbiter lander rover mission to the surface of the moon by the ISRO. If you have any questions about the mission or would like to learn something specific about the mission, just let us know in the comments below or at Today in Space Pod on Instagram and Twitter. This is easily one of our second most popular posts, so people are definitely interested in the mission. So we'd love to know what you'd like to learn about it, and we'll touch on it here. Why? 
In other orbital news, I thought I was listening on my way to work to the live broadcast of the Rocket Lab electron launch for hashtag Lukma No Hands mission from New Zealand. I was really excited and I was pumped up and I even made a post on Instagram about it, but then I found out I somehow watched a launch from June 29th of this year. So regardless, I enjoyed it, but I did delete those posts that I put up when I thought I had actually watched that launch, I was all excited. I was like, hey, congratulations, blah, blah, blah. And then when I was finally <laughs> out of work and took a look at what I, I posted, we took them off. So those are updated. But anyways, what actually happened was on August 19th, Rocket Lab's Electron Rocket had its eighth successful launch, a big moment for the new fast-growing startup. Uh, if you're an aerospace engineer or passionate about working in space, I would start looking there. If, if I was right out of college, I probably would have jumped on that opportunity. Um, I'm excited to see how they grow. There's, there's a similar excitement I have for SpaceX in the early days. You know, for me, I've always wanted to launch a CUBE satellite as a mission. And it was always my, it was actually a capstone project that I worked on in college. You can actually read that paper if you'd like. Uh, it'll be in this week's episode description or on this episode's page on todayinspace.net. The mission we were prepping for was a solar observation mission where we would uh, gather data for space weather. And it was a lot of fun. We had a, a 3U stacked CubeSat. So this is a 1U. So it had three of these stacked and uh, deployable spring-released uh, solar panels so we had enough power for the mission. And I worked on the structural team. So you can see what that was like, what a capstone project from my alma mater was like. You can check that there. Uh, but back to Rocket Labs, the thing that I'm really excited for from them is the value that they're bringing to customers looking to send small satellites to orbit. Not only are they offering launch services, but I just saw a brief commercial in that, what I thought was a live launch, uh, but it was a commercial that they played during that launch of the service that they're offering where you can go to them with your sensor or payload or whatever you're trying to bring into space, the tool that will help you gather knowledge from going to space. They will then help you build a whole spacecraft that will fit around your needs. So you don't have to go to the eight different companies to grab one part of your whole spacecraft from each one. It's super expensive. There's no streamlined process for this type of thing. It's a brand new market. And what they're doing is basically saying, what are your mission needs? Come to us, we'll build you a spacecraft, and we provide the ride at the same time. So you're going to get next level integration with uh, your launch provider. You'll probably be able to inject into more precise orbits with their new photon bus that's going to deliver these payloads into specific orbits. So you, you send the first and second stage up into orbit. You have this photon bus deliver and, and go, once it's already in orbit, it goes to a specific place and it'll be able to release these satellites in more high quality, accurate orbits, which just makes the whole mission even better. So in short, they're offering a service that can help you optimize your launches with tailor-made solutions for small satellites. I mean, this will bring the cost down of sending a mission to orbit altogether and at a higher rate than is available today. And having a one-stop shop for your science will bring more people into the market because it makes things easier and cheaper at the same time. It's brilliant, so I love it. I love what Rocket Lab's doing. Finally, we can't forget to mention that the cherry red Tesla Roadster with Starman in the front seat has officially gone a full orbit around the sun. The same car and Starman that was the dummy payload for the first test launch of the Falcon Heavy. A day I will remember for a long time. I was in the car on the top of, my, of the parking structure where I was working at the time, freaking out, watching it live on my phone. <laughs> I spent the week prior nerding out with friends at work as we were waiting to hear when it would happen and what the payload was gonna be and just dreaming of what would happen if they actually did this and what would happen if we have a vehicle finally capable of sending humans to Mars or the moon again and the fact that it was being tested right now that we got to sit there with our phones and watch it when we don't even have to be at the launch like that that whole thing it how can you not get excited for this if you haven't already you can watch our launch breakdown of the, the whole test launch with footage of the launch from 
atop the vehicle assembly base, thanks to my hometown friend, Rebecca, who works at NASA. So thank you, Rebecca, for that. You can watch the three-minute clip here on YouTube or on todayinspace.net. Just search for Starman when you're on the website. As a closing thought, though, how long will the Starman actually orbit the sun? Five more times? 50? 5,000? 500,000? Will Elon retrieve it to put it in SpaceX headquarters, or will some other eccentric billionaire send a future trip to retrieve it and put it in a museum? Time will tell. All we know is that it's in orbit. It didn't really go in the orbit it really was supposed to be in, but it's there, and Falcon Heavy is now an asset for the space industry and humanity's efforts to go to the moon and Mars, thanks to our eccentric billionaire in space. So to close out my thoughts this week on why I think that SpaceX is so popular, especially in and in, in why we have this SpaceX, SpaceX versus NASA rivalry almost. And I was trying to think of like at the core, what what is it about the situation? What is it about SpaceX that makes us root for them so hard, even though they push the boundaries and could potentially be unsafe? Like what makes it what, what makes someone like me want to want to root for them? Someone who, who knows the science behind it, who knows how dangerous things can be. And it's funny because it takes me, you know, it's all, it's all down to spreading love and spreading science, right, for the, for the podcast. It's our mission statement. Um, we're not trying to spread negativity. We're trying to spread love, and we're trying to spread science. That's why we're moving into, now we've gone into weekly content, and as we get better, we'll be able to put more and more content out there because they're in my opinion, isn't enough of it. So, so we're working on that. And one of the great things I've enjoyed recently are my new shoes. If you guys haven't seen them on our Instagram page, they they say positivity and optimism, and they've been they've been a a, a source of of power for me as as we have been going weekly and just entering a different stage of the show here with with both my relationship with the show and then you know we're putting out more content than ever before. It's funny how after looking at the the content for a few months, I can already see that I've started to change my game and step up my game. And it was only after watching Gary V, Gary Vaynerchuk, for those that don't know, uh, that I finally found the confidence to go every week. There was just something he said that unlocked something in my brain, and I was like, oh, okay, that makes sense. Someone was just saying something that I picked up on, and I ran with it. Um, so Gary V had a future goal that was achievable. That That's that like why I understood what he was saying. He was He was explaining a goal that in my mind was reachable, for the future. And now that I'm, I'm stepping back, I'm being a little bit more patient. I'm not trying to rush this. I'm really just trying to document what I'm already doing here, what I'm already doing on a daily basis. I'm already head deep into this, into science and space all the time. I need to find a way to better communicate that to everyone in a format that I can do and not you know, have to be a slave to it. So that's what I've been working on lately. I am a believer in what Gary Vee is saying because he's offering positivity and optimism in all of his stuff. And that's how you become a believer in a movement or behind a human path change where the history of the human race is affected by a moment. And a perfect moment that this is an example of is JFK's push to go to the moon. That was filled with positivity and optimism. They set a goal that was at least reasonably possible, although at the time it seemed completely crazy. But they would go to the moon, that you know, that they would go to the moon in the next decade. And everyone was focused on that one singular goal to get there. And it wasn't easy. <laughs> and it was a lot, there was a lot of crazy unexpected <laughs> that happened, but they achieved the goal. And because the goal was so was close enough for them to actually reach every time they made a step forward it seemed more and more possible that they could do it and that's the beauty and of positivity and optimism and a goal that is set that's actually achievable it affects the whole space industry although we're seeing uh, it get better because of the private industry's influence and they're doing really well and and there's momentum behind that and NASA has been whiplashed almost every eight years, as far back as the Apollo program, with a new directory and a new plan when the original plan was not really achievable in the right amount of time, you know, in eight years, basically. I mean, let's be honest. 
Ever since the shuttle program ended, the communication to the public about what NASA is doing has not been able to get the public interested enough that the politicians are being driven to vote on certain things because of what their constituents care about. It, it just seems to me like a huge turning point for the Apollo program when they made the move to publicly show a launch live and let people at home get involved in the progress of the technology. Then optimism and positivity spread because more people were on board and interested in what this new, bigger, better future looked like and the things they were doing to get there. The reason all the people really love SpaceX is because they're getting involved in something that is exciting and makes us think of a fantastic future. What SpaceX is doing gets us behind it because they're going, the plan is to go to Mars and, and we are seeing their development. We're seeing all the individual stuff and they have a huge public following. They didn't need government backing to get this involved. Well, they need funding to develop the technology, but they're doing all this extra stuff to get people involved, to spread that positivity and optimism. I mean, a lot of what Elon's shtick is, is a fantastic future. All the things that we want to happen in the future, he's developing the technologies to make those things possible, right? That's what a lot of the allure is. And I don't like harping on NASA about this all the time. And I'm seeing a lot of change from them, actually, within their media broadcasting. And I think it's all for the better. I think this is great. But I think NASA's biggest challenge right now is figuring out a goal that's achievable in a certain amount of time. Now, do I think that the Artemis 2024 mission is too soon of a deadline for NASA to accomplish? Yes. But is that deadline possible if SpaceX or Blue Origin gets it right, if their technology is ready? Because I mean, if you look at the momentum, both of these companies are primed for this sort of thing and to get it done in time. You know, we're about to have that 200 meter Starhopper Starship test uh, just weeks after the 20 meter hopper test. You know, is that, is that spaceship, is that spaceship, that starship ready to bring people to Mars? No, absolutely not. It's, it's a water tank with rockets attached to it, but I'm seeing them work on it and I'm getting excited about watching the spacecraft develop, develop and change and become the thing that it actually is to let physics and aerodynamics in of reality shape what the actual thing is going to be like that will enable us to travel interplanetarily, to be able to send a hundred human beings at a time. And as a SpaceX fan, I'm confident in what SpaceX can do because I saw them develop the rocket, the reusable rocket, that lands. Before then, it was not possible. I was an aerospace engineer, believe me, I can tell you this. It was not possible. People who were academics teaching this said it was impossible. I had at least two debates with professors when I was in school getting my aerospace engineering degree. Good, good debates, not even bad. And you would not believe that how much they didn't believe it was possible because they just, they thought it was a physics issue. They, they thought it was a, a chemical fuel propellant issue that the, they just, they weren't thinking of the business side of things. And the reason people love SpaceX is because we don't care how it gets done. We just care that we actually start trying to do things in space, that we're trying to expand in space. And if that means we need an eccentric billionaire who smoked a blunt on Joe Rogan's podcast, guess what? I'm going with that crazy bastard. And the same thing goes for Jeff Bezos, Jeff Bezos, who every day is starting to look more and more like Lex Luthor. So yes, I'm going with them because they're actually progressing space. I am rooting for them because of that. And what NASA needs to do is just set goals that allows them to generate positivity and optimism around their space program. You know, it's really more of a culture game. They're really trying to get people interested while at the same time develop a technology. And I think there was a huge reason to do so during the Apollo program because they were shoving money into that program. 6% of the GDP, it was the number I remember, 6% of the entire GDP of the country was going into the space program. So people had to you know, taxpayers were saying, well, all right, give me something. So they smartly said, let's film it and got more people involved. I mean, it would be a huge disservice to humanity if we let this bubble of momentum in space and interest in space die without taking full advantage of it. At least the private sector 
really is. And NASA is, is rightfully behind this. They've been funding companies like SpaceX and, uh, and people like Blue Origin and stuff like that. So they're, they're involved. It's not that they don't know this. It's that the system gets shuffled every eight years by a new administration, and then they have to start over. So you can't move very fast like that. So that completes my thoughts. I really thank you for joining us this week. Uh, let me know what you think. I know there's been a lot of discussion online recently with that, that latest thing that came out yesterday about uh, a new potential option that there may be a, I believe it was a, is it a six billion? Let me pull up this article here. Uh, Newt Gingrich, uh, Republican Speaker of the House, uh, was reported in Politico that he wants to award a $2 billion prize to the first company that lands humans on the moon. Um, and, uh, you know, it would either be Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk at, at, the, at the look of it because they're the only two with uh, moon landing type equipment. So it's, it's like, okay, the money is theirs if they succeed, right, which would have been the money we would have spent on NASA's program. And if they can do it, let's give them the money. I don't hate that idea. I think uh, the momentum is in the private sector. So if we have another option and we don't defund what NASA is doing, I think it's a great idea. Um, we've got to invest in both right now. So um, I like the idea. i got to look more into that. I'll follow up and see if that actually sticks, if that's actually a real thing that'll happen. But a lot of stuff is happening in space. Thank you for joining us. Uh, if you want to follow along, you can check us out at Today in Space Pod on Instagram and Twitter. Um, that's the way you can follow us. We're doing a lot of stuff there. Our Facebook page, Today in Space Podcast, we're really active there. Uh, we share a lot of funny stuff there as well. A lot, of, a lot of space memes. A lot of space memes on the Facebook page. Uh, also, just talking about supporting the podcast, you know, we we talk about it kind of every episode, but, you know, when we do ads here, when we talk about AG 3D printing, where you can get stuff 3D printed or, or buy models that we've made ourselves here, like this amazing phone stand, which is in the shape of a rocket ship, just kind of like Starship. Um, that's available in our Etsy store at ag3dprinting.etsy.com. These, these are all ways you can help support the podcast. You know, um, AG3D is the idea workshop. A lot of that has helped fund the machines. We're able to help others bring their ideas into reality. So, you know, if you've got something that's a, an idea on paper, we can take you from that to a physical object in your hands that you could sell to other people. You could use in a, in a pitch meeting if you're trying to get some funding for your idea. You can actually have a version, a prototype of the real thing to show people. Um, it also makes great gifts. So... Uh, by getting any of that stuff from us, using our services here, you help fund our space science communication efforts. So you help fund the podcast. You help us create more content to teach people how to 3D print at home, which is what we do with AG3D printing, uh, as well as offer services. And there's also things like you can get a free audiobook by going to audibletrial.com slash today in space. I would highly recommend Chasing the Moon, which makes a great audiobook. It's also a PBS six-hour feature, which you can get online. Um, it's also available online to buy. We'll have links to that on there. I've, I've had many requests for the actual link to the digital book, so we'll have that stuff available on this week's episode. All those things help support the podcast. Appreciate you. Make sure to subscribe to the podcast, Apple Podcast, Spotify, uh, wherever you like it, YouTube, we are also on DTube. We're expanding into uh, the cryptocurrency and blockchain efforts online. We have our Steemit page and we have our DTube presence, which is an alternative for YouTube. Hello there, DTube. Yes, I am a real person. I do actually exist. Uh, but thank you for joining us. We'll be back next week for another episode. As always, spread love, spread science. I am Alex Finals, your science communicator. We'll see you next time.